Good morning. My name is Karen Schaefer with Compass Family Journeys. Uh, today I wanted to go over um, basically the medical screening portion of a journey for uh, gestational carriers because I do tend to get uh, quite a few questions on this particular topic, especially because it seems to kind of come on quickly. Uh, so medical screening is one of those areas where, you know, someone may be waiting for a little bit of time. We finally have a match. We have that match call. And then all of a sudden, boom, we're into travel and we're into getting things done because nothing else can happen until this medical screening is done. And so I find that some of uh, the gals that I work with can be a little bit uh, taken back by how quickly we get to this point. And even if we've gone over some things in the past, it can be like, well, wait, 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 how exactly does this work? What am I supposed to be doing? And so I, I thought that this could be a good one to go over a little bit more in depth and also a way for people to go back and see it when they're coming up on medical screening to know what is um, going to happen and how the whole process is going to look. Uh, so a few discussion points uh, for today, we're going to be looking at what they're looking for, what they're screening for, uh, the timing of it, when it's completed, uh, about travel, and if it's a necessity for this part of the process, and then what happens if something does come up during that medical screening. Uh, so first and foremost, why is there a screening? So what is it? Uh, it's going to, it's essentially a doctor's appointment. It's a medical visit and it usually occurs at the clinic that your intended parents are using for the journey. Uh, most of the time it, it's going to occur at their clinic because their, uh, um, their doctor is going to want to have his or her eyes on you uh, specifically before the process begins to make sure that um, you're meeting the, the criteria and the qualifications that that particular clinic has. So it is something that is um, where, where they're basically screening to make sure that everything is looking optimal for a future transfer before we really start getting involved in the next steps of this process. When is it done? So this is going to be dependent, um, or I'm sorry, what is done? I'll get to when a little bit later. What is done? It's going to be dependent on each clinic. Uh, the most common procedures and, and things that are being done during this is going to be some sort of um, sonogram uh, or, you know, ultrasound. The, the most common that I've seen with the clinics that we work with is going to be a saline sonogram. Uh, and then there's going to be some blood work that's done, a urine test. They're, they're kind of getting a picture of overall or your whole health. And how long does it take? So again, this is going to be dependent on the clinic. I have some clinics that I've worked with where it's very quick. It's in less than an hour uh, because it's focusing more just on those medical pieces and they may have done you know, your, your full on talk about the whole process and everything over the phone earlier or they'll set that up after the, the screening. And then I have other clinics where it can take three or four hours because they have kind of you know, they call it a full day workup. Um, I never really see it go quite a full day. I think four hours is about the max that I've seen. Uh, but it's it can be a lot more, um, you know, involved for that one that one visit that you're uh, traveling for. So the tests and what they're screening for. Um, so this is going to be the, the first thing is going to be that, that sonogram or that looking at that uterine health. Okay. So, uh, the most common one, like I said, is going to be that saline that sonogram and what they're doing in that, um, so that you're kind of prepared is they're filling up your, your uterus or that uterine cavity with a saline solution and that kind of opens it up and it lets them evaluate everything um, within within that uterine cavity to make sure that there aren't any abnormalities or anomalies or any um, damage that may have previously been done that could hinder a, a, an embryo transfer. The other thing is going to be those those blood tests and the lab work. Uh, so the clinic, like I said, does need to get a view or an idea of your overall health. Uh, and there's really not one size fits all on this. So I have 
I've seen some clinics where the list is a mile long on things that they're testing for. I have other clinics where they may have like 10 to 15 different things that they're testing for. Um, most common things or the things that they're looking at are going to be, you know, like just a basic like CBC panel um, for, to look at your health, um, thyroid function, uh, vitamin levels, and making sure that everything's kind of up to par. Uh, immunity, like if you if you still have immunity to certain childhood vaccinations, uh, and um, any like active or past infections that that could have you know play a role in, in success on this. Uh, you'll also chances are high that you'll do a, a urine test, uh, and so that that urine sample is used to um, also look at you know other infections that may be present, and then uh, also a, a drug screen. They need to make sure that there's um, you know no current lifestyle choices that could have a negative impact on a um, on a pregnancy and they just need to make sure that you qualify on that front too. So the timing of screening, this is what I was trying to jump forward to earlier in this. So uh, there are going to be some agencies, maybe some clinics that will do a medical screening prior to match uh, with with my uh, agency, since I tend to work with quite a few different clinics. I, I will do the records review. We'll, we'll read through the records and everything, but your physical screening where you need to, you know, go to be physically evaluated will not happen until after your match is in place. So um, this is where uh, you've seen a profile for intended parents. They've seen your profile. We've had that match call and everyone decides, okay, this is right. This is, you know, this is what we're going to move forward with. Um, so that's in and like i said that it is because it's typically going to be a case where their doctor specifically wants to see you and in, in his or her office uh it's also going to be cycle dependent so i'd like to point this out too because some people will be like you know i had a friend that she was matched and then you know next week she was flying out and you're telling me it's going to be more like six weeks and the the reason why this occurs is because it really does depend on where you are in your current cycle. Uh, in order to conduct some of these tests, especially like that, that saline sonogram, uh, your, your lining has to be at a specific point in the cycle to where it's optimal for them to visualize everything that's happening. So uh, if you're, you know, say you're expecting your period in like, you know, under two weeks, we've kind of missed that window of that thin lining uh, earlier in the cycle. Uh, so chances are going to be good that we're going to have to wait until your next period starts and then kind of reevaluate the timing and maybe um, put you on some birth control pills in order to kind of put you in a holding pattern or uh, a clinic may need to see you during your natural cycle on a very specific cycle day. So that's why it does, it depends on the clinic you're using. It depends on where you are in your cycle as to how fast we may need to get you out there or how, um, how long we may need to wait depending on how that's looking. And then the length of the trip, uh, this will be dependent on where you're located and where the clinic is. I have been able to get people in and out uh, within a um, within a day. Uh, so it looks very similar to like a work day where, you know, maybe you fly out on an 8 a.m. flight. You've got a midday appointment and then you're flying home at like 4 p.m., you know, or home shortly thereafter. Uh, other times, depending on how those flight schedules are looking and the clinic schedule, it may need to be an overnight, maybe two. Uh, very rarely do I have two overnights, but if I need to like fly you in the night before for like an early morning appointment and then fly you home after the appointment, that's also a possibility. So it's just going to really be dependent on you know how those flight schedules are looking. But overall, both just for convenience purposes uh, for the the carrier, I want to make sure that we're getting you in and out and not you know making you be away from home for longer than necessary. And then also from a monetary standpoint, um, it's like we haven't. This is like just the very very first step. So I I want to make sure that we're we're not um, making it so that it's a major financial undertaking for your intended parents before we even get to legal. Um, so I do just try to you know, just make that as quick as possible and and get on with the with the next part of the process so with travel uh so this is typically where the conversation leads then when i'm talking with um 
with gals over at the medical screening, uh, you, you're not going to be financial financially responsible for any part of um, this this process in general, but especially when you're traveling. Uh, so the areas that are going to be covered by your intended parents are going to be your airfare, um, hotel if needed. So if if that if we do need an uh, overnight, that's obviously going to be covered for you. Your ground transportation. This may be a rental car, depending on, you know, how the pricing is looking. Um, it may also be like Uber or Lyft. Uh, it only the trips like to and from the airport, the hotel, the clinic would be covered for those. So it doesn't mean you can still kind of go out and do and see other things, but um, your intended parents will just cover, you know, the basic uh, necessary trips for, for this process. Um, your meals, it's, it's most common to get like a food per diem amount. Uh, so if you're traveling by yourself for like two days, then you'll get $50 per day to cover to cover your meals for that. Uh, and then, of course, if, if you do need to take off time from work or if um, you're the primary caregiver and, and your uh, children typically have you home, if you're having to take off time or you're having someone step in to, to watch your children in your place, then those those uh, um, costs will also be covered for you from from your intended parents. Um, a companion. So for the most part, a clinic um, is not going to require a like either a spouse or partner um, or just a companion for medical um, purposes to to come with you to screening. Oftentimes, it's just going to be a, a screening of the surrogate only. Um, so it's not from from like that standpoint, it's not typical to need someone to come with you. Uh, I do find that for the most part, because it is kind of a quick trip, uh, most women that I work with will just be like, you know, I'll just go by myself. It makes more sense. It's easier, you know, hubby or partner can stay home and kind of help out with those, you know, the daily day-to-day -day stuff with the kids or whatnot. Um, but, uh, if, um, if you aren't comfortable traveling alone or the clinic does require your your uh, spouse or significant other to be there with you for their own testing, uh, then of course we would make those arrangements for a companion to, to travel with you. Uh, for the transfer in most cases, I would say probably 80, 80 to 90 percent of cases someone will take someone with them a companion with them it's just the the medical screening that seems to be a toss-up at times uh and then how do things get paid so uh airfare when when we're talking about your flights that's going to be covered uh, that's purchased for you on your behalf and then right before you go on your trip, what we do is we'll send you funds uh, to, to then be able to cover things like your meals and your ground transportation based on estimates for that or the, the rental car costs uh, so that it is in your account and ready to go. Uh, it's not something where you have to make sure that, you know, you kind of buff up your, your personal account in order to uh, make sure that those things are covered. And then for if you do need a hotel, we will arrange that with the hotel with um, with an authorization form so that that is also paid on your behalf. Uh, and then any sort of lost wages or child care, those are reimbursable expenses. So once you get back from your trip, then you'll provide uh, either pay stubs or an invoice for child care, whatever is needed to then get you reimbursed for those those costs that you're um, that you already incurred. And then what if something is found? Last question that I get a lot. So what what happens? What happens if something comes up? Uh, I really don't want people to be stressing uh, the medical screening appointment because it's it's not a matter of, um, you know, they're they're looking for that, you know, the perfect uterus and perfect blood work and nothing to come up. What they're doing is they're looking for things that there may be issues with currently that can, are fixable, you know, things that we can work on, um, have you do uh, further evaluations or further tests, further procedures uh, in order to get everything to those optimal levels for, um, for that transfer of the embryo to have the best chances of actually, you know, implanting for a successful pregnancy. Uh, so it's, and I do try to, you know, it, yeah, kind of give this heads up to intended parents too, that it's, it's okay. If something comes up, it doesn't mean, um, 
that we can't move forward. All it's doing is saying, hey, we, we need to make sure that this gets taken care of before um, before we move into a transfer so that we are basically reducing down risk as much as possible. Uh, so there will be some things that will be automatic disqualifications, either, you know, permanently or it's just not right at this time um, based on some of those levels and such. But uh, for the most part, um, it, it, there, there are things that will come up that, you know, are, are fixable and they're treatable and, and we can still move on. So if additional procedures and, and tests are needed, um, sometimes that does mean that you have to go back to the clinic for that. Sometimes it can be something that can be taken care of at home. Uh, say you've lost immunity to a you know a certain um, a, a certain thing that you may have been vaccinated for as a child. So you may need a, an additional vaccination. Of course, we're not going to have you travel for that. That can be done close to home, or maybe you know your thyroid levels are off or your vitamin d levels things that are can be a simple fix then that can all be taken care of with like your primary care physician back at home uh if it is something that a procedure is needed um most common that i'll see is what's called a, a polyp removal uh, which is basically small little um abnormalities found within the uterine cavity that uh, should be removed just so we're um there, there's nothing that could inhibit implantation of that that embryo. If it's something like that that you know does need to be done by the fertility doctor, uh, then it will typically mean another trip out there. It could happen you know in a week from the time we get your results all the way up to you know a month or two out. Um, but you would work with the clinic to get that on the books and then of course the the trip for that purpose or to, to have that taken care of will look really similar to your med screening appointment with travel and, and costs and everything along those lines. So I hope that that kind of gives a, a decent overview as to what happens on that, that medical screening appointment and how it looks, how everything is taken care of and the timing of it. I, I really would love to be able to hear from you and, and answer any further questions that you have either on the, the medical screening portion of this or any other part of surrogacy to see if it might be the right um, path for you to take. Uh, and so if you've always been thinking about it or just want more information or you're even ready to apply, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the website is compassfamilyjourneys.com. You're also more than welcome to email me. Uh, that's typically the best way to get a hold of me. That email address is family at compassfamilyjourneys.com. I hope you have a great rest of your day here and thank you for listening in today.